Ling Tan lifted his head. Over the rice field in which he stood to his knees in water, he heard his wife's high, loud voice. Why should the woman call him now in mid-afternoon, when it was not time to eat or to sleep? In the further corner of the field, his two sons were bending over the water, their two right arms thrusting together like the arms of one man as they planted the rice seedlings. Ho! he shouted. As one man, they stood at the sound of their father's voice. Is that your mother? he inquired. They listened. Two sturdy young men. He felt his belly move with pride at the sight of them. They were both already married, and the eldest, Lao Ta, had two sons, the youngest now only a month old. Lao Ar, the second, had been married four months and his wife was beginning to fret. Besides these two, Ling Tan had his youngest son, Lao San, who at this moment was sitting on the water buffalo grazing somewhere on the round, grassy foothills along this valley. There were also two daughters in his house, only one of whom was left to be wed. The elder he had given to a merchant's son in the city, whose walls could be clearly seen from behind his house. At this moment, his wife's voice came too clearly for any mistaking. She bawled at him heartily over the fields. You old bone, where are you? You deaf and dumb. It is our mother, Lao Ta exclaimed. All three men grinned at one another, and Ling Tan put into the water the sheaf of rice seedlings he was holding in his left hand. It is throwing away money to stop in the middle of the afternoon like this, he said. You two, do not stop. Free our heart about that, his eldest son replied. The young men bent again to their work, and with each swift thrust of their hands into the muddy, tepid water, they planted a green seedling. Their feet sank into the rich mud under the water, and upon their dark, bare backs the sun was warm. Beneath the wide woven bamboo hats upon their heads, they talked. These two sons of Ling Tan's were good friends, and had always been from the moment they could remember themselves. There was less than a year between their births, and they had always told each other everything. Even marriage to two separate women had not separated them. These women they had been discussing when their father called, and to them they returned when he went away. They were still so young, these two men, that their own bodies and what they ate and drank, and what came into the day and the night were all stuff for wonder and talk. So far as their thoughts yet went, the world was bounded by the green hills around the valley where their father's land was, which was to be their land, and the center of the world was the Ling village, wherein all who lived and died were their kin, and had been for hundreds of years. Even that great city was only their marketplace. When there was a harvest of grain or vegetable or fruit, they went there and sold their harvest and that was all they knew of the city or cared to know. Since their sister, born just after them, was now married to a small merchant in the city, they sometimes blamed themselves and said they ought to go and see their brother-in-law, but they seldom went. There was enough to busy them on the land. Under their hats they now talked, without abating one whit of swiftness in the thrust of seedling into mud. Behind them was the watery, empty field, and in front of them the even rows of green seedlings standing firmly upright. Can a man tell when what he plants in a woman takes root? Lao Ar asked his brother. It is blind planting, Lao Ta said, laughing, and so it must be done over and over again. It is not like this planting we do in the light of the sun. Does she struggle against you? At first, but now never, Lao Ar said. Leave her alone for three days, and then behave as though it were the first planting, Lao Ta told his brother. He went on in manner of the elder to the younger. When a man plants his seed, the soil must be prepared. That is to say, the seed must not be thrown down anyhow. 
All must be made ready, and only when it is ready may the seed be cast. Nor must the seed be scattered as the wind blows weeds. It must be thrust deep into the earth. So, and so, and so. Each time that he repeated this word, he thrust his bare, dark arm down into the wet earth and planted a sturdy seedling. 